Okay. Gordon, um, Hong Kong government here tells uh, people that there's a lot of background uh, radiation. What, what's the difference? What, what's the problem with nuclear power plants and the radioactivity? Well, background radiation does exist, for sure. There are radioactive materials in the soil, and here in Hong Kong there's a lot of granite, and the granite has radioactive materials, naturally occurring radioactive materials in the granite, which give off what's called penetrating gamma rays. And these gamma rays, they're like x-rays, only a little more powerful. And they do damage cells, and they do cause, they add to the burden of health effects. They're not harmless. Okay, that's why they talk about background radiation, because they are concerned about when it's more elevated, you will tend to see more incidence of cancer, for example, other kinds of health effects. The difficulty with a nuclear power reactor, however, is that it mass produces hundreds of different radioactive materials beyond those that exist in nature. And if you look at the radioactive materials in a nuclear reactor, they are generally millions of times more radioactive than the naturally occurring materials that we're talking about here. So, um, and they not only give off the penetrating radiation that uh, we call gamma radiation, but they also give off alpha and beta radiation. There are naturally occurring materials which also give off alpha and beta radiation. But if a nuclear accident malfunctions, as at Fukushima, these materials are spilled into the environment in such a way that they become part of the natural environment. They, they get recycled into the food chain, they get into the soil, they get into the animal's flesh, and they get into the bodies of human beings who eat that food or drink that water which is contaminated or breathe that air which is contaminated. And so these particles, these materials, get lodged in the human body in different organs. Each one has its own particular pathway through the environment. And there are hundreds of different varieties. For example, iodine-131, everybody has heard about this from, from Fukushima and from any nuclear reactor, in fact, you get iodine-131. But it goes in the body, it concentrates in the thyroid gland. Mm. There's nothing in nature radioactive that does this. Uh -huh. Iodine-131 is a man-made radioactive material and it has this peculiar property that it goes to the thyroid gland and causes damage there, not only thyroid cancer, but it can cause other illnesses in very young children who are developing. It can cause mental retardation by suppressing the activity of that gland. Mm. It can also cause physical re stunted growth, and it can cause neurological damage. So there's all kinds of damage that can be done by the fact that this radioactive material is interfering with the normal operation of the thyroid gland. Here in Hong Kong, there's nothing like that. This would be something that would only come either from a nuclear explosion or from a, a malfunctioning nuclear reactor. And that's only one example. There's many, many more. There's cesium-137. The background level of iodine-131 is zero. There's nothing. The background level of cesium-137 is zero. The background level of plutonium is zero. So these things are not part of our world. They're not part of our natural world. They're only part of our world as a result of atomic bomb explosions and nuclear reactors. The splitting of uranium atoms has introduced a whole galaxy of new radioactive elements into our environment. To say that radioactivity exists in the natural world is like saying chemicals exist in the natural world and therefore we shouldn't worry about chemicals. But in fact, some chemicals are worth worrying about. They're much more dangerous. We have this uh, terrible experience of the Chernobyl accident in 1986. Could you explore a little bit on, on what happened then and what were the consequences in, in Europe and in Canada? From the Chernobyl explosion that took place and the fire there, the graphite fire that lofted this material high up into the air, so it spread out very far uh, or around the planet. And uh, even in, depending upon which way the wind blows, you know, there's a, there's a graph on our website, uh, www.ccnr.org, which shows the, uh, how the wind blew in different directions at different times and sent the, the radioactive materials in different directions. So uh, much of the time the wind was blowing kind of uh, to the north and to the west, and as a result of this, uh, Belarus got very heavily contaminated with cesium-137, one of these man-made radioactive materials. 
England also got a lot of this and the sheep farmers for example in just as one example the sheep farmers in northern England and in Wales were unable to sell their sheep for up until just a couple of years ago more than 25 years after the Chernobyl accident uh, because of the cesium levels that were in the sheep meat from the sheep eating grass which had collected the radioactive material from the air so that's that's an example even in Canada we had a problem with uh, the Inuit people uh, the radioactive cesium falls to the ground and collects on these small plants which grow about this high called lichen, reindeer lichen and uh, the the caribou in Canada they migrate in herds of tens of thousands of animals and they eat a lot of this lichen and as a result they end up with high levels higher than normal levels of cesium-137 in their bodies much more so than any other type of animal and uh, and then the Inuit who eat the caribou meat they end up with higher levels in their bodies too so this material once it's disseminated into the environment it remains a problem for decades and decades afterwards one sobering thought is that of all the cesium-137 released from the Chernobyl accident more than half of it is still there in the environment because it, it only it, the half-life is 30 years so only in in 30 years has half of it gone yeah. and changed into something else still there okay thank, thank you so far